Thank you. Now, Donald mentioned earlier how we need to keep the little people of the world safe from abuse, and this program is about actually going directly to those little people to equip them with tools to keep themselves safe from abuse uh, as much as they can, also working with adults, of course. Um, the Hedgehogs program is a primary prevention program that was delivered in three schools in London to children aged 9 to 11, part of, as mentioned, a European pilot initiative. So it also involved Italy, Spain, Slovakia and the Netherlands. Um, so today I'm going to give you some feedback from our experience of delivering the programme in London. I was responsible for evaluating the programme, so if you are interested to find out more, um, come to me later on or contact me and I can send you a copy of the report. Um, today I'm going to try and bring to life the, the report, really. Um, there's going to be lots of pictures, so hopefully it can keep you awake before the coffee break. Um, you might be wondering why it's called hedgehogs. It be important for me to explain. Now, it's a metaphor. So hedgehogs need to keep close to each other to keep warm in the cold weather, but they can't get too close, obviously, because they might hurt each other with their quills. So that's why. It translates to the complex relationship between adults and children. So it's important to share affection, but to also respect each other's needs. Key objectives here, five key objectives. So the programme identifies the uh, potential for children to actually do something themselves to keep themselves uh, safe from abuse. Um, even this age group, some people might think that they are a little bit too young for this kind of thing. Um, that was a concern from um, some teaching staff and some parents at first, but as the programme went on, uh, there was less concern. Um, so the programme is all about equipping the children with, the, with rules, principles, the knowledge, the understanding that they can say no if they feel uncomfortable about something, and building their confidence to approach trusted adults with any concerns that they might have. Now, the programme is five lessons long, each lesson two and a half hours to three hours long, one session a week. Um, before the programme starts, it's important to say that the facilitator um, from the Lucy Faithful Foundation meets with the teaching staff from each school who are going to be involved in the programme to debrief them about what the programme's all about and what they might need to do throughout the programme and what kind of things the children might come up with throughout the programme, just so that they're prepared. Also, a debriefing... Sorry, it's briefing, not debriefing. The briefing session is also held with parents and carers so to also um, give them some understanding around the programme, alleviate any concerns that they might have also around the programme, answer any questions, and prepare them for what kind of questions the children might come home with, uh, particularly after um, the puberty session, the uh, second one. Also, importantly, at the end of the programme, there's a debriefing session, uh, one with the teaching staff and one with the parents and carers, to get feedback from them where to gain some learning for us in terms of continuing the programme and so on. Also importantly, um, just to mention, each lesson involves a lot of activities, a range of activities. Sarah <coughs> mentioned earlier it's important to, to keep things fun for the children um, and that's really to help embed their learning and integrate the knowledge. Um, a lot of scenario-based learning, and I'll give you a couple of examples of scenarios that we used with the children to help them learn. Um, also, we advised the schools it would be good for each child to have a workbook dedicated to hedgehogs uh, that they can fill in at the end of each lesson and maybe do extra work on in between lessons too, just to help really consolidate learning. Now, a key part of the programme as well is the confidence box. Uh, you can see here it's a box with a slit in it and it's for the children to pop in a question. So any question that they might have that they might be afraid to approach an adult and ask about. Um, uh, they can mark their question as either public or private. So public if they are happy for that question to be read out in front of the whole class in the next les lesson or private if they'd rather it was dealt with one-to-one -one with the facilitator. So this is encouraged to be used throughout the, the programme. The box was left in the classroom between lessons. 
Now, also, actually, I'd like you to have a think over the next five minutes or so as to what you think the kind of questions were that children would ask in the confidence box, and I'll ask you for what you think in a few minutes. So, in the meantime, I'm going to take you through each lesson very, very briefly to give you a taster of what, what happened and what the children thought. This is where some pictures come in. Uh, so, lesson one is really aiming to help children to develop respect for each other's differences um, and also to practice being nice to each other. Um, this kings and queens activity, for example, this uh, involves each child... So children take it in turns to sit on a throne, pretending to be either a king or a queen, and the other children write comments about that child, nice comments. <laughs> it has to be monitored. Um, and then that child gets to see these comments. So it, it actually gives children the opportunity to receive nice comments about themselves as well. And that can help to build self-esteem and confidence. And this exercise and another exercise during this lesson are really good icebreakers as well, because it's the first lesson. The children need to feel comfortable with the facilitator because some difficult issues are going to be discussed further on in the programme. Um, I couldn't resist putting the this one in, because it's quite ironic, so if you can read it, she is a good queen because she helped me to spell, and clearly can't spell. <laughs> anyway, moving on. So, lesson two is about puberty. So, making sure that children understand what happens at various stages of development, um, and the differences between the male and female body. Um, on the left there is um, an example of a flip chart that the children wrote on with words that they already knew about puberty. Um, what was surprising in this lesson across the board, you know, with all the children we worked with, was just how much they already knew um, about, you know, words to do with sex and so on. Um, but what was concerning was that a few words they knew, but they didn't actually know what they meant. So, for example, the word rape elicited some laughter amongst the children, and so a discussion had to be held around actually what rape is and it's not a laughing matter. Um, on the right there you'll see the kind of sources where the children got their knowledge from and again that was what was quite surprising to the teaching staff and the facilitator just you know, adult magazines um, pub <laughs> um, various uh, places where children got their knowledge and and these sources actually influence or appear to influence their understanding of certain words. And, for example, the word gay was, was quite a stereotypical uh, view um, held by a lot of children and appeared to have been influenced by TV programmes and so on. Now, moving on to the next lesson, lesson three. Um, now, introducing an understanding around the difference between positive touch and negative touch, um, a series of activities, of easing them into that, and, and using traffic light coloured cards to state whether they felt comfortable about certain types of touch. And just getting, getting an idea, really, that of that kind of uncomfortable feeling that they might get in their belly. So a bad feeling in their belly is how the facilitator described it really and, and also this lesson was helping to build their confidence in saying no if they do feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable about something. The second part of this lesson started introducing scenarios so helping children to really think about real life situations that could happen and what they would do in response. Again using the traffic light coloured cards to say whether they felt that particular situation was safe not so safe, or not quite sure, and discussions were held. So, for example, one scenario was uh, the park keeper urges you to go to his house. Um, it was a bit concerning that a few children said they would go with the park keeper. Um, and if the park keeper tried anything, then they'd manage to escape. Maybe they got that idea from films that they'd watched, watched where someone always manages to escape. But it just highlighted the importance of working with children at this age because they are vulnerable. Now, lessons four and five, more and more scenarios um, and encouraging more sort of deeper thinking about these scenarios as well. So you can see four key 
elements that the facilitator encouraged the children to really think about. Um, this scenario here um, evoked an interesting response from one child um, who said, oh, my, my uncles wouldn't do that to me because we're Catholic. Um, so that, that was um, quite concerning. So things like that come up from these scenarios. There was also a scenario to do with a priest caressing um, a child in a, in a strange way, and a uh, few children had had trouble grasping the fact that a priest would do that. They said, well, well, they're religious, so why would they do that? So a lot of issues did come up there, and it also highlighted to the teaching staff and the facilitator children who might be more at risk or might need more one-to-one -one work done with them between lessons or after the programme had finished. One really good um, example of learning uh, happened after the fourth lesson when two children were travelling home on the bus. Um, they looked out the window and they saw a younger child from their school uh, standing with uh, a woman they didn't recognise. Uh, it wasn't the, the child's mother. Um, the two children on the bus had a, a conversation with each other and they agreed they didn't feel comfortable about, about what they'd just seen. So they stopped the bus and they got off and they went over to the woman and the child and said that uh, we want to take him to his mother. She said no. Um, so the children still weren't happy with this. And one of them went off and found a teacher. The teacher came over and actually the, the children had actually judged the situation correctly. That woman shouldn't have been with that child. She wasn't, she was a stranger. Um, so it's just... It's an example of some excellent learning, really, taken from Headshots after just the fourth lesson as well. They hadn't even completed the programme. Now, down the bottom, you can see um, a little Hedgehog logo bug. So it's a little fluffy Hedgehog with a white ribbon attached to it at the back there. Each child was given one of these at the end of the programme, and asked to write the name of a trusted adult or a few trusted adults that they could go to um, if anything happened to them, if they, if they felt uncomfortable at, about anything, if any of these situations happened to them, anything. Um, so there you can see um, the child has written my sister Charlotte, but what you probably can't see is they've also written she's 20. So just making sure to say that it's the trusted adult that she'd go to, not just her sister who's 14. Um, so yeah, the children had something to take home with them, to remind them and to show their parents and, and they're encouraged to talk to those trusted adults and to let them know that they are the people that, that they go to. A few children couldn't identify a trusted adult, which was, was worrying, um, but that highlighted to the teaching staff, those children, and that they'd need to do some work with them. So, confidence box, I'm going to give you an example in a minute of the kind of things that children did ask. But has anyone got any ideas of the kind of questions that the children may have come up with? Anyone? <laughs> Probably a range of uh, uh, sex-related ones, which was the case. <laughs> Particularly after lesson two, puberty, a lot of questions were put in that box. And sometimes at the beginning of... of the lessons the facilitator had to spend a long time in discussion with the children. Yeah? I wasn't guessing on a question, but I wondered if any child in Rock the Dead would be a child that actually put something into indicate that might be being abused and what that might um, throw off. Yeah, there are a couple. If I show you um, a, a few of the uh, questions that were put in, obviously the bottom, <laughs> the one over here, obviously it's just I put that in there to just as a reminder, they are young children and to expect that they're going to ask silly questions. How does a cow make milk? It's not related to the whole programme. But things like this middle one here, why does the boys see stick out when they look, when they like a picture? And what happens if a girl has sex with a man but the girl never had her period? Those kind of, of questions were put in that could highlight, it, it just, you can ask questions, oh, how, how does that girl know that? What has she been exposed to, potentially? Um, the one on the right um, about having sex with a man but never having had her period. It might just be curiosity, but it might be highlighting something. Um, one question that isn't up here, 
was how do I know who I can trust? And that, that was highlighted to the facilitator as potential cause for concern. And a big discussion was generated in front of the whole class around that. And actually, just um, of interest, some of these questions led off into other areas of discussion. So that, how do I know who I can trust question, led off into a discussion about gangs. And, and it, it, a whole issue arose um, with concerns about local gangs and the children were really afraid of them, but they didn't know who to talk to about what was going on. So this programme can actually lead, lead on to other areas. So overall, very, very good feedback from the programme. Uh, here's an example of, of just some of the comments that we got back. The programme seemed to improve communication between parents, carers and, and the children. Um, teaching staff said that they, they really benefited from the programme as well, not just the children. They felt they had more knowledge around how to deal with certain issues rather than just going straight to the head teacher. Um, and it mentions there, oh, up here. So following the helping the children to understand the difference between positive and negative touch and understanding that they can, they can say no to certain touches. It really seemed to help them to understand boundaries. Um, and when they were playing in the playground in one school, the teachers noticed they were being a little bit more careful as to where they, where they tagged the other child when they were playing tag. Um, so, good comment. We'll move on to the last slide. We learn a lot from this. Um, here are some key um, aspects of learning. So in each lesson, it's really important for two or three members of teaching staff to be present. Uh, really, firstly, to keep the children quiet if they're fidgeting or uh, chatting um, so they can focus, but really to have those issues highlighted to them if anything does come up so they can follow up on those issues afterwards because ultimately, our facilitator went in for, for those five lessons and then after the debriefing sessions didn't go back. So it's down to the school then to keep an eye on those particular children and, and to co continue the learning really. Uh, rearranging sex education classes, a couple of the schools made sure that they, they moved their sex education class to follow the puberty session, so the second lesson. Um, that second lesson really, ideally, would be longer because so many questions came up from the children. Um, and it really helped to get the ball rolling, the teachers were saying, in terms of sex education because they said they just found it very hard to broach the subject. The confidence box, integral to the whole programme, and the schools wanted to keep that confidence box there after we'd left. Um, so hopefully it is still there now. Other topics, as I mentioned, other topics can arise, such as, you know, there was a discussion around gangs. Anything can crop up. So if you were to deliver a programme like this, anything could come up. And the class composition. Um, so this programme is very, very interactive, and it can be influenced by different cultures. So, for example, if, if there was a class full of, of children who are maybe Muslim, then this could impact on the, the delivery of the programme. So we had two Muslim children in one class um, whose parents allowed them to stay um, in the, the lessons, but they're allowed to listen but not to participate. So if there was a larger proportion of, of children who were Muslim, um, then it, the interactive nature of the programme, it just wouldn't have worked so well. So in terms of thinking about how this programme could be applied to other cultures, um, or indeed uh, schools where there's, there's a high proportion of special educational needs or disabilities, so um, there would be a lot of aspects of this programme that, that would need to be altered. But thank you for listening. If you are interested in learning more, I do have that evaluation report I can give to you. I can talk to you some more about it. I'd be interested in hearing from you if, if you've delivered a programme similar um, and we can learn from each other. But thank you. Thank you very much, Henna. And Hedgehog is one of my favourites, as Donald knows, and I make him have a hedgehog picture on his presentations because <laughs> I think they look so sweet. Um, 
If there are any questions, just in the interest of time, perhaps you'd like to talk to Hannah now. Do you want, or do you want a quick question? Do you want... So uh, this, this man's asked uh, whether we're going to roll out the program. Um, if not, why not? And, and if we are, when? And so on. Okay, we would love to roll this program out um, to all schools in England. I guess the ultimate problem is funding uh, resources. So ultimately we need that money um, and, we, and we need the staff to be able to, to actually integrate it amongst the schools. Um, Feedback from this programme as well. The teaching staff felt that it fitted in really well with curriculum. There are so many positives about the programme um, that really it, it would be so beneficial for all schools to have this. Um, but yes, money. Uh, Donald might be able to add some more to this. I don't know if we have any plans, but it is, it is resources really at the end of the day. Um, can I ask... Oh, sorry. Donald, do you want to respond to that? Look, I think, I think we would love to, to, to extend it further. In, in Italy, the, 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 the parent pressure is making it keep going. In, in, in England, there are, there are individual primary schools that have, that have taken it on, and we can clearly make the materials available, but I think then it goes with the confidence to deliver the materials, and, and that's the next trick. So, so whether it's a, a school delivery, whether it's an external body like Lucy Faithful coming in to deliver, the, 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 the thing that's, that's, that's crushing at the moment is, is simply a, a lack of funding. In London, there are three schools who are paying for us to go in and deliver it, or for colleagues that have delivered it before to go in. And that can be expand as much as those funds can expand. It's just, uh, but, but you know, people have got to see that there's a resource, and there's, but there's a serious payback. I think. Yeah, my question was just about, uh, which I think Donald has touched on, is did your evaluation identify whether it required an external facilitator or if the teacher is confident, are they perfectly able to do it? The evaluation um, noted from feedback, really from teaching staff, that it would be preferable to have someone external come in, um, you know, partly because of the because they're independent, you know, the teachers are, are there all the time with the children, the children might not feel as able to, to talk about these kind of issues. Um, and also some schools, I mean, some schools who have a learning mentor, not all of them do, um, they might find it easier, or be, find it more effective to deliver this kind of programme because that learning mentor isn't a teacher who delivers um, all sorts of lessons. They're, they're a bit more removed from everyday life in the school. So, I mean, some, some schools might be able to, and of course, if they feel confident enough, um, many of the teaching staff involved in this programme, they said they didn't feel confident enough, but might require a bit of training. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult to know, but it, yeah, there are some issues. Well, thank you. I'm sure there are other questions. I'm sorry. Do you, would you mind asking Sarah over the break? Because uh, it's very interesting, and I think really one of the very good examples of a primary prevention program which has been evaluated and evaluated across countries and cultures, and we need more of that type of evaluation.